This presentation is on the Indus Valley script of an area at the time of about 2400 BC to 1700 BC, the, what's considered the Bronze Age, of Pakistan and India, what we call Pakistan and India right now. It ran along the Indus River. There were sites along, major sites along the Indus River from the, from the mouth of the sea up into the Punjab and then also down along what is now a dried riverbed of a major river that later was called the Sarasvati and the Gagar. We don't know what it was called at the time, of course, which ran all the way down to a site, a very important site, called Latol, which we call Latol now, which apparently was a site where sea trade happened between the Indus Valley and contemporary civilizations, the main one being that which later was called Mesopotamia, which was the culture of the Sumerians, and then after that, the Akkadian period. And the mature Harappan period, the mature Indus Valley period, is um, basically contemporary with the Akkadian period, which we know a script from then called, uh, and from there, called cuneiform, which of course began as Sumerian cuneiform. This is really important because we know trade occurred between these two civilizations and probably indirectly as well with Egypt. At the time, of course, what were the Egyptian hieroglyphics as well as the cuneiforms of Mesopotamia. And so although we would not claim, at least at this point, that there was any language affinity between the two or three cultures, and also not really script identification, as in the signs are not the same between them, but there was influence probably of script design, of script concept, because we're talking about the very first scripts that were ever created on Earth. So this is a very interesting thing, that those scripts happen to have been, not coincidentally, between major civilizations that traded with each other. When a decipherment process is begun, the very first thing is to define how many signs there are and what those signs are. The collection of signs is called the signory. So what, what happens is researchers go through all the inscriptions that they find, whether they're carved or drawn or whatever way they're rendered, and try to sift out from that how many signs there they are. They then draw them out carefully to identify sort of the generalized version of a variety of versions of, of the same sign. Of course, there'll be changes because of scribal hands, but basically the same elements make up, say, one particular sign. Then they're computerized um, to be standardized lots of times, and they're made into lists. And those lists are called signories, and they're counted. The count matters because the count itself determines what type of script that is, and that's initially very important information. If it's 23 to 26 signs, it's obviously an alphabet. Uh, if it's 85 to 95 signs, it's what's called a syllabary, and that tends to be the type of script that existed at that time. A uh, syllabary represents sounds, but it represents more than one sound. It represents a syllable of sounds, in fact, which could either be the sound, of, uh, a syllable made up of a pure vowel, just simply a vowel, or it could be made up of a consonant plus a vowel, either as consonant vowel or vowel consonant. Um, and how that's defined in the, in the ancient world is as uh, a consonant plus how many vowels existed in their language. So for example, and it's because they could hear that. We say B, we don't say B. So we would actually say B, which is really B, E, or B, I, depending on how you would look at it. And that's exactly what they heard when they were trying to represent sound. So they would have a separate sign for B, E, a separate sign for B, A, a separate sign for B, O, and so on. So for each consonant. So that makes about 95 signs, if there are, say, five vowels. The next type of script which the Indus Valley script fits within is called a mixed script, and that's about 400, well in case of, in the case of the Indus Valley script, arguably around 400 signs. Um, a mixed script, script is made up of sound signs like syllables, syll syllabic signs, and also non-linguistic or non-sound signs like pictograms, which would be the initial development of script typically was in pictograms, which are simply drawings of things. Then ideograms, which are ideas that are not things, so there's nothing to draw, but there's a, a, 
a reminder in some way. Often the same word means two different things, a picture as well as an idea, like red, red, for example. Um, and that would be represented via certain principles uh, developed into signs that represent ideas, ideograms. And then also other sorts of signs like determiners, which might indicate whether you're looking at a vowel or a I mean, excuse me, either looking at a noun or a verb and other sorts of signs like that that are non-linguistic signs. Uh, the only other type of script really is when there's 10,000 signs, and that would, of course, be Chinese. The signs, since we don't know this, what sounds they represent, or even if they represent sounds, then have to be coded by number so they can be identified. We wouldn't want to call a sign, say, the jar sign, which does tend to happen, but we want to have something we can actually very objectively refer to, so we code them by numbers. So in a sign list, the very first sign would be number one, the second would be number two, etc. Similarly, when the inscriptions are all drawn out by, these, by the standardized drawings of the sign, so the very careful lists are made of all of the words that exist, known to date, and are of course added to as archaeologists stick up more, um, of every inscription that has been found. That's called a corpus, a body of signs. It's like a dictionary listing without definitions or identifications of sound. And those then are also coded by number, and that number defines where the inscription was found, how many sides are on the inscription, um, how many, uh, and which side is being read um, at, the, at the time. Um, this sort of information. One of the best um, of the corpora is a corpus of, of it, it contains a signory and a corpus. It's by Iravata Mahadevan. It was published in 1977. It's called The Indescript Texts, Concordance, and Tables. It's published through New Delhi, the Director General Archaeological Survey of India, if you're interested. Once these two parts are defined, the signs and the lists of words, then the decipherment process begins. There are two main methods that are used for decipherment ever since the peoples tried to decipher cuneiforms and the Egyptian hieroglyphics. One is called the comparative method, and that is simply to compare what is, what is unknown with what is known, as in this undeciphered script representing an unknown language um, with known languages of known scripts. The problem is the comparative method has been unsuccessful time and time and time again over each language and so it has been asked by researchers recently and in fact before um, why that comparative method is used so heavily still who knows why people do use it I think probably because uh, they do know contemporary languages of the same geographical area so they go with that, but that tends to be totally unsuccessful, basically. The successful type of decipherment process is called internal reconstruction, and that's where no other language or script is considered. The script in, in, that is being deciphered is analyzed based on pattern analysis, based on, on features in the language. So, for example, there's a positional analysis where to define if there are suffixes, if there are prefixes, infixes, um, if more than one word exists in an inscription, what type of, of language it is, types have been defined already in linguistics. So these kinds of features can determine which type of language it is, it is representing, the script is representing, even when we don't know any of the sound values or any of the meanings of any of the inscriptions. Stop. With the internal reconstruction method, we can use pattern analysis and frequency counts um, and feature identification um, in order to build a foundation. In, or, in other words, those features then will define what type of language it is underlying the script and then can be used uh, with other comparing to other languages with the comparative method to say uh, determine if there's any affinity with languages that existed at the time in the in the general geographical area. Of course, there could be not. I mean, it could have been totally lost, but there, there's always a chance of that. Um, in other words, the internal reconstruction method builds a solid foundation rather than a house of cards.